So we're going to begin. We're holding in Yov chapters 18, 19, and 20. We'll do three chapters. This is the second round where the friends of Yov have an opportunity to respond to Yov's criticism of what he said earlier. And now it's Bilad's turn. Bilad is the one that takes the microphone now. <laughs> He's the one that begins to speak for the second time. And he rebukes Yov for his way of thinking. He says, your way of thinking is not right. You're not thinking in a proper manner. How do you have doubts? How do you not believe in Hasharat HaNefesh, that the soul will continue to exist? From everything you say, that's what it seems to be, is that you don't really trust that that is true. If that's the case, that you don't believe that the soul is something different than the physical body and that the soul continues to live in the afterlife, then what would be the difference between the human being and an animal? They just both go back to the ground. They just go back to the earth from which they came from. It is apparent. It is obvious. If you look at the human being, the way he was created, he has so much wisdom. He has free will. He was created in the image of Hashem. He's unique. He's very different than an animal. So how could you say that the two are the same? They live and then they die, they go back to the same place. That doesn't make any sense. The human being was endowed with something spiritual, which the animal did not have. And that is not necessarily easily observable. And we know that. We learned about that. But people who analyze life and who pay close attention will see this, will reach the same conclusion. You cannot say that man and animal are the same. Not only that, once you see the differences, you should come to the conclusion that there is something spiritual about the human being, something apart from his physical body, and that this spiritual entity called the soul does continue to live on after the death of the physical body. In other words, it's not completely gone. Sometimes it appears to be like that. People cry, the man just passed away, the woman passed away. They're gone, it appears to be. People even express themselves, I just lost an uncle, I just lost a relative. You didn't lose them, they're still around. They're actually in a better place than you are. But we don't see it, so we react like that. So Bilal continues to say, in the same way that the nefesh is the essence of the human being, in the nefesh, the soul continues to exist in the afterlife. What you see here in this world is really not the truth. The success of what you call, what you consider the success of Rasha, is only a temporary success in the success of the physical body. Because we're talking about, after all, pleasures, enjoyment. But in the end, the wicked will be punished. Nothing will remain of them. Depending on how evil they were, they might not even have a share to the world to come. They die and they cease to exist. And there are some whose punishment is so severe that they don't even get up in Tchiyat HaMetim, in the resurrection. And his children may be killed. In other words, he may lose everything he ever had. And that is the most severe punishment of all, when a man loses everything he ever had. Now, when Bilad is saying this, Iyob is actually thinking that he's pointing to him. This is what happened to you. But not necessarily. So Bilad is describing the life of Rasha, but he's not necessarily pointing fingers to Iyob. But Iyob has that impression that here his close friends are criticizing him. And Bilad continues on to say, but the tzaddikim, the righteous who suffered in this temporary world, they will get, instead of this physical world, their reward in the afterlife. So it pays to go through this temporary world, which doesn't last so long, and get rewarded what is due for one's deeds, the one's righteous deeds, in the eternal life. It's mm -hmm. eternity. 
So this is something that was said before. This is something that everybody pretty much was in agreement with. But Yov had a hard time. He was struggling with this because he wanted proof. He wanted to experience it in this world. He didn't want a promise for the afterlife. There are many stories of individuals who have come in a dream to a child or even to the doctor who disconnected them from the life support machine because they thought they were doing him a favor. You will suffer less. And it turned out the deceased was complaining. Why did you do that? I had a few more days in this world to go through the pain and suffering that I needed to for an atonement. And then I would have been finished. Why did you disconnect me from the life support machine? It was painful for them. They would rather have had the pain here than above. So rabbis call these pain and suffering Yisurei Sha'a, the pain and suffering of an hour. In other words, a temporary life. It is a lot better to have it here than in the afterlife. So Bilad continues on in the second round to tell Yov, listen, Yov, you're criticizing us. You're saying things that don't make any sense. Your criticism is without any proof. There's no way that you can back up what you're saying. So why continue to argue? No use to argue and to criticize what we're saying, even though he doesn't accept what they're saying. But at some point, you got to stop because you're repeating yourself and you're not getting anywhere with your arguments because you don't have any proof to what you're saying. So what should he do? Instead, analyze your situation, analyze, investigate the topic a little bit more in depth before you make any suggestion. Before you say anything, before you either agree or disagree with what we're telling you, learn a little bit more. A lot of people just react, criticize, are upset without really thinking about the argument. And that's what Bilad is telling you of. Think a little bit more about this. In reality, in life, what happens is that rabbis tell us, God has many messengers. And it just could be that the Rasha, even though he feels secure and he's doing well and he has all the money in the world and he's confident about himself, there are all kinds of traps, Malkodot, which the Rasha is unaware of. Because Hashem has many messengers, how a person will fall how he will leave this world, not necessarily in bed. It can happen in all kinds of ways. And there are some, the wisest and the richest would never have dreamt that it would happen to them. And there is such a story with one of the Rothschilds. And the Rothschilds were blessed and their blessing of wealth went on for many generations till today. But not all of them remained religious. There was one specific, there was one particular individual who was a banker, very wealthy, and he once expressed himself, he was so confident, from hunger I will never die. You know, I know, based on the money I have, that from hunger I will never die. Why would he say that? Because people died of hunger, people died of all kinds of diseases. So he said, at, at the very least, I know that from hunger I won't die. And what happened to him? He once got locked up in his walk-in safe. You know those big safes? He got locked. He didn't have the key. He couldn't get out. He knocked. Nobody heard him. He was there by himself. He locked himself in. And he saw that his time was, was going by and that he was going to die in the safe from hunger. There was a little bit of air, perhaps, but he didn't have any food. So what did he do? He pricked his finger, he didn't have a pen. And with the blood from his finger, he left a note. And that's what he said. I once said that I will never die of hunger. And here, this is what I'm dying from. Rabbi say about this, Al tiftah bela satan, don't ever open up your mouth to the satan. No, don't make such suggestions. You never know what could happen. 
Just pray to Hashem that everything should be well. Don't be so overconfident. There's all kinds of traps out there. All kinds of messengers, including something that you never dreamt of. That could happen too. But what's the point of this? The point of all of this that Bilad is emphasizing and so are his friends is Atzur Tamim Paolo. As the Torah says, Hashem's ways are correct. There is nothing exaggerated here. There's nothing done without a certain cheshbon, without a certain reason of why it happens this way. Unless, of course, somebody takes his life. We're not talking about that. But if something happens to someone and he dies of hunger, he died in a car accident, God forbid, he died from some other disease, he was killed in battle, or he died in the plague, it's all from Shemayim. And it's all correct and it's all just. This is the way it needed to be. So those who are wealthy and those who are powerful in a powerful position, they shouldn't be overconfident that that wealth or that health will last for too long. That was chapter 18. In chapter 19, Iov responds to Bilad. Bilad, you know what you guys are all doing to me? You're causing me tremendous anguish, tremendous pain in the way you're talking to me. Even if I made mistakes, that's interesting that he says that, even if I made mistakes, look what I'm going through. Does that make any sense to you that I should be punished the way I was punished? And by the way, the way I spoke, even though you didn't like it, the rabbi says, you cannot accuse a man of saying certain things when he's in pain. He's not under full control. He's not thinking right. It's not completely his fault for saying what he said. During the time he's in pain. So you can't argue with him during this time. It's not possible for him to evaluate the situation properly. So why are you blaming me? You're accusing me. But now he adds something that he didn't say so, much, so clearly before. You guys are going to be punished. You're going to be punished for what you did to me, for the pain that you caused me. You shouldn't talk like that to me. You shouldn't make things worse. You know the saying of pouring salt over a wound. That's the way he sees it, at least. It's hard for him to hear these words. And he says, you're going to be punished from Shabbat, from heaven. The reason why he's so upset is especially because he thinks that they are pointing fingers towards him. Because you are an example of that individual who deserves perhaps this kind of punishment. So because he thinks that they are talking to him, in other words, it becomes something personal, he takes it personal. They're not talking in general terms about just someone. They're not just having a class in philosophy. He is going through this, so he feels that they're talking to him, using him as an example. See, if it happened to you, there must be some reason behind it. And then he goes on to say, and as far as my doubts in the Emunah, my doubts in the faith, my doubts about belief of certain things, like if the soul continues to exist in the afterlife, yes, I express certain doubts. But I never publicize them. This is what I feel. This is what I thought. This is what's going through my mind. But I never really went out and publicly declared it and taught this. And he's right, by the way. There's a difference between thinking about these things and definitely going out and declaring this and publicizing and trying to convince others of this. And the rabbis point this out, the commentaries mentioned this, that in some ways Iyov never really outwardly expressed doubts in Emona. He may have struggled with it. Yes, for sure, it's obviously struggled. But there's a big difference between struggling and keeping it to yourself and then going out and telling everybody about it. So therefore, Yo says, the way I see it is all the suffering that I went through is not mitzadadim. It's not from justice. No. There must be some corruption here. There must be something that's not straight. This doesn't fit in with justice. And he goes on to explain in this chapter how he suffered in every possible way, not just himself physically, mm -hmm. not only that his fortune was taken, 
his kids were taken, and now he says, on top of all of that, it looks like my friends became my enemies too. <laughs> so now everything is wrong. And even you, Bilad, pretty much that's what he's saying. And Bilad was his closest friend, from all the friends, he was the closest. The way you're talking to me is the way an enemy talks. And I think it's a good time to point out that some of what he is describing in this chapter, the pain and the suffering that he went through, very, very difficult pain, is also described in this week's portion of the Torah, this week's parasha, parasha Kitabu. Pain and suffering of the likes that we should never know, the Torah says, may happen to you, to the Jewish people, if you don't follow the Torah. And here we are, a couple thousand years after the fact, and we can look back at our history and say, yes, all of it came true. Do you know that there was even an episode or two where women ate their own babies? Who would ever dream that they would go to that extreme at a time of hunger? Everything is written in the Torah. It's described exactly if the worst of punishments would ever come. At certain times of our history, unfortunately, we experience all of what is described in the Torah. Now imagine you were in the Holocaust. What would someone be thinking if he's in the Holocaust, seeing what he saw? Little babies being thrown against the wall and crushed. Mothers holding their babies and being shot. People being buried alive. People being burnt alive. People being gassed, right? All of the death penalties that the Torah describes, this. All of those happened to the people who went through the Holocaust. Many people suffered all kinds of strange deaths. All kinds of deaths, including some of them went through experiments on their body. They experimented with them, men and women. We have no idea what they went through. Now, Throughout history, Jews did suffer in all kinds of ways, in very brutal ways. There was a lot of brutality committed against the Jews and others throughout history. Some nations were very, very cruel. But here you had the righteous, the elderly, babies, entire families, entire communities. Incredible, incredible pain and suffering that the world never saw in such numbers and cruelty. So, from a distance, if somebody were to look at it as a spectator, he may even say what the verse in Eicha says. It appears that God, has become our enemy. It would give that impression. Such torture, such suffering, so much pain. Six million Jews, just in this Holocaust, and there were other Holocausts, there were other programs. Now, let's go after the Holocaust, and let's take the survivors. Yes, it's true. There were some survivors who I personally knew, who were married before the Holocaust, and had 10 children, and lost all of them. Lost their wife, and all the children. And came to this city, remarried, and had several children again, and rebuilt their lives. They picked up the pieces. They didn't just despair. They didn't just give up hope. They started all over again. Many people like that. And that's beautiful. But not everyone had that courage. Not everybody had those sentiments after the war that it's time to rebuild. A lot of them don't even share it with their kids, what they went through. The trauma is still there. Some of them went through six years of hell depending which country they were from. The Polish, the Lithuanians, those in the vicinity, they suffered the longest, the most. So this is an example of where people saw the most terrible things that you could ever imagine, which the Torah describes can potentially happen. So it should not come as a surprise, but still, human nature is shocked. And we cannot judge these people. We don't know how we would react, but it has broken a lot of people. It has shaken them up, where many continue to have nightmares for many, many years. So imagine, here we have Yov, who's going through something similar. And this is before, of course, the Torah. 
there's no way for him to have any idea why this is happening. He would love to know. Of course, we would all, all love to know why the Holocaust happened, the exact reasons, but we will never know. While we're alive, Hashem does not reveal to us everything. But it's sufficient for us to know that when something of that magnitude happens, it's indicative that Hashem is not happy, obviously. The Torah therefore tells us, don't be surprised if these things happen in the country. Learn from it. And that's what the friends of Yom are pretty much trying to tell him, even though they're not completely right either, because he was a righteous individual. So towards the end of the chapter, Yom says, I hope one day somebody will read my story. <laughs> no, is that this should be documented. And will agree with me that this is not real justice. There's something else going on here. I don't know what it is. It doesn't seem right to me. Because his friends don't agree with him, criticize him. So I hope one day somebody reads this and feels the same way as I do. That's how it says. But as far as the, the survival of the soul in the afterlife, Yom reacts as follows. What's left of me? Look, I'm bones, no flesh, can barely eat. I throw up everything, I vomit everything I eat. I'm sick. What's left of me that should continue into the afterlife? So he's already making the mistake by assuming that the nefesh, whatever nefesh, whatever spiritual entity is there, is connected to the physical body. So when the body goes down to the grave, so does the nefesh. He doesn't understand, he was never taught, that the two are completely separate. The body goes to the grave and it decomposes, but the ruach, the shuv and elokim, the spirit returns to Hashem. It's something completely separate. So that's why he says it in that form. What's left of me? He says, why should I think even about this? Look at me. What's going to go to the afterlife? And we gained a lot of clarity once the Kabbalah became public knowledge in Yari gave classes on mysticism, on Jewish mysticism. There are many, many topics that became a lot clearer to us. And many of the questions that we may have had once upon a time were answered, at least partially, through the study of the Kabbalah. So towards the end of the chapter, he again makes a point of telling them, Midata Din, the attribute of justice, is going to punish you. There is a prohibition in the Torah of Lotonu Ishet Amito, don't abuse your friend. There's two kinds of abuse. One is financial and one is verbal. To inflict pain verbally. To make somebody feel bad. To belittle him. To ridicule him. To accuse him of something that is not true. And make him feel bad. It's a sore. It's forbidden to do that. And he's definitely right. That Midata Din, the attribute of justice, is going to punish you. So what's his mistake? His mistake is that the eyes of the human being, the f eyes that are f of flesh, cannot possibly know everything and see everything. So he, he may be right about what his friends may be punished one day, perhaps, for overdoing it, for not being sensitive enough. But where he's wrong is that you can't talk like that. Because it's obvious that the human being has no knowledge of everything. It's not possible for him to know everything. Last chapter that we'll do today is chapter 20. Mm -hmm. And this is this time it's Sofar, who spoke before and now speaks again. He gets his turn. And he was more into philosophy. But he realized last time from his discussing philosophy that Iyov was not happy with that either. But his main point was Iyov. There's a difference between knowing something from somewhere and feeling it. You expect to, to know things through feeling it, experiencing it. But this feeling can only feel that which is external, that which happens externally. It cannot really know what's going on truly internally. In other words, what's behind the scenes? What is the truth? What are the actual facts? To feel and experience it physically, you will never, never be able to know everything that there is unless you have previous knowledge. Knowledge is what is needed here, not for you to feel. And you are judging everything by how you feel. 
I see, I feel, I experience, this is the way I judge things. No, you can't. There's something that knowledge has with greater clarity than that which we see through our life just by our own personal experiences. And that is one of the complaints that we have about science. Scientists would like to feel or see things to be able to admit or to be able to agree if something exists or not, if something is real or not. But not everything is physically possible for us to experience or see. What can we do? It's just that we're used to living in a physical world and we expect to be able to see everything. But tell me, can you see bacteria? No. You can't see everything. And even with special tools, you can't always see everything. You can't see electricity, but we see the effects of it. So it's wrong to say that you will only believe if you actually see it with your own eyes, if you physically feel it or experience it. Therefore, in reality, so far we would also be able to answer regarding the question of why the wicked has it so good in this world. He would also be able to philosophically deal with that question that it's not possible for us to know what is really good and what is really bad. Oh, he has it good. Do you think that is good? Or he has it so bad. Who's told you that that's bad? So therefore, it, so far, could have used this argument of this approach to deal with that question too. No, the Rasha doesn't have it so good. You think that's called good, but that's not good. But he doesn't because he knows from the past that Yov did not like to argue philosophy. What you're saying is good for philosophers, not for the simple person. Well, that's what he sees. He sees the guy just made a million dollars. He won the lottery. Why him and not me? The average person, that's what he sees. That's what he would believe. So don't come with a philosophical argument and try to convince me. So therefore, so far in this chapter says, you know what, Eo, I won't talk philosophy with you right now. I'm going to talk to you about the success of Rashaim. You think that the wicked are so successful because you saw a few of them in your time. You did not see what happened to those that lived before you. I can tell you for a fact, I know about this, there were many wicked people before you in the past, before your time, who failed in a big way. You know, it was after they went up and prospered and apparently succeeded, they failed in a big way. They lost everything they ever had. They were killed. They never benefited from all their evil deeds. I can tell you. And I can assure you that the ones that you see now, at some point will also fail, will also fall, will also lose everything that they made. Now, let's talk a little bit about the great height that they reached for a moment. Lots of money, powerful positions. Let's talk about that a little bit. And I'm just trying to, in a few words, pretty much cover his idea, instead of going word by word. He says, you know, sometimes when a person grows, when a person reaches a certain height, that height that he reached is the reason for his fall. So you think, oh, look at him. Look what he gained. Look how much money he made. Look where he is at. You don't know that Hashem brought him there so that he can bring him down. <laughs> in other words, the aliyah, the growing, or the height, is in order for him to tumble down. And by the way, that's going to be before Mashiach comes, that's going to be one of the reasons of why the Midrash says that the standard of living will be higher than it ever was. And usually I explain it because Hashem gives us the means to be charitable and kind to others. So we can rectify the baseless hatred with love and unity. And that's very true. However, there's another idea behind it. If Hashem wants to bring people down, if He wants to degeneration to suffer tremendously economically, He will first make them comfortable. And after they've been comfortable for a couple generations, you know what it means and what it will feel like to come tumbling down, like during the time of the Depression? Had it been 
that we're living like they lived 200 years ago, with a lot of poverty, simple life, without all the luxuries that we have today. And then all of a sudden we don't have as much money. So we have a little bit less than what we had before. But imagine people who have two cars, perhaps two homes, lots of money in their savings accounts, stocks, and a lot of, a lot of property, you know, whatever. They're wealthy. You know, imagine that they lose all of it, or a lot of it. Their pain will be a lot greater than had they not had it. That's what he says to Eov. Sometimes you don't understand it, but the fact that he's going up is because he's going to feel the pain a lot more when he comes down now. As the saying goes, the higher you climb, the greater the fall. You heard that? Sure. So therefore, so Father tells you, know, if you really want to see this in real life, you can't see just a couple frames of 30, 40, 50 years. You have to see several generations. And you don't. We don't live that long. But you have to look at a real broad segment of human history, perhaps four or five hundred years, and then examine it and see what happened to the wicked. And then you'll be able to reach a better conclusion. Not through a short period of time in your life. And he goes on to tell him, have you seen other generations? Have you seen other wicked people who have been successful before? No. You're only looking at a short period of time. Tofak then goes on to tell him, and by the way, the fall of the Rashak had happened suddenly. He's healthy, he's young, and all of a sudden he dies from a heart attack. Something happened to his money all of a sudden. He made a big mistake. Somebody conned him. You know what that means? To con, to cheat. He, yeah, he didn't realize what he's doing. He thought he was making good investment. All of a sudden he finds out that this is a con man. And so much of his money was taken away. But what kind of money? Money that he earned from illegal means. Sometimes what we see, even though that's not expressed in the book, but it's a concept that the rabbis tell us. It's a concept that is taken from the Torah. That Hashem mishalem nesonav la'avidav. Hashem pays the enemies. Hashem pays his enemies. The wicked makes them prosperous in order to get rid of them. So he gives them a lot of the reward that's coming for some good deed that they may have done. He pays them off in this world in order to remove them completely from the afterlife so that they don't have anything in the afterlife. So sometimes he pays them off here. So there's all kinds of explanations of why we do see the wicked prospering. But many times it's short-lived. That's what Sofani is telling you. You don't see, you haven't seen enough to be able to properly understand what's going to be with the Rasha at the very end. And what could happen at the very end is that he loses everything or himself. All of a sudden, without anybody expecting it, all of a sudden he became very sick. He was stricken with corona. Yeah. People died from corona. People died from all kinds of diseases. And they were healthy. Something happened. One of the worst kind of situations is that the doctor made a mistake. Mm -hmm. But even though that may be so, in reality it's all from Shemaim. The angel of death was there. The time has come. He just did it in this way. So we think it's the doctor's fault. People start blaming all kinds of things. In reality, it's all from Shammai. It's all from heaven. But the, the worst part of this is that when a person dies suddenly, he may not even have time to do Teshuvah. He may have time to repent, to say, I'm sorry, to return their stolen money, if he stole money. That's the bad part about it. Another possibility is that even though you see this Rasha, this evil person, successful, so rich, he may never enjoy his money. He may always be nervous about it. He may not even want to spend it on himself and he becomes a miser. And that's a disease. Not to enjoy it yourself, your money that, that you made, kosher money. It's just like a person who's sick, who doesn't have an appetite to eat. It's good food and it's actually good for him, but he's so sick, he can't get himself to eat. So imagine this kind of a punishment to Rasha. He's not losing his wealth. He's going to keep the wealth and not be able to enjoy it. What do you say about that? So you see, Yov, there's all kinds of situations out there that you're not even aware of. You 
think he's so great, he's in a high position, he's so successful. You don't understand. And tomorrow, by the way, he could be a different man altogether. Either he will lose his money in a strange way, or he'll become sick. He won't be able to enjoy it. So a lot of times what happens to the Rasha is that, that that excessive overconfidence makes him believe that he will continue to be like that forever. You'll be able to enjoy the life, the good life, the drinks and the food. But one day, he sees himself in the hospital, connected to pipes with intravenous, no good food, <laughs> no nothing. And, nothing. and he was fine, he was healthy. But it can happen. There's something called the bug. <laughs> From a bug from a bite of an insect even. Infections, they can do a lot of damage. And when that happens, a person can become very, very sick, and it could be a long time that he will be sick in bed. And then what? Then a lot of times, a lot of the money that he had goes to doctor bills. So all that he made, that you thought he made, he doesn't even keep, he doesn't even enjoy. Another example of what can happen to the money. So much expenses all of a sudden, people who have to take care of him. Or he dies in a plague. There's all kinds of rich people who don't get to ever enjoy their money for all kinds of reasons. So if you look at his life, all that effort that he put into making the money, and it could have been a lot of effort, he realizes if he's smart, it didn't pay for the couple years that he enjoyed it, that he had it. Well, in the end, he has to give it back, he has to spend it. It doesn't pay, but people don't think about that. And if nothing happens to him from outside, nobody takes away his money, nobody steals from him, nobody hurts him from the outside, so far continues on to say. It doesn't have to happen that the arrow should come from outside, he says. It could happen that the arrow comes from inside. What he means is that he could be attacked by some illness. So look, Iyov. It's not that the money necessarily is going to disappear because armed robbers are going to hold him up. It could be that something internally is going to get to him. And he won't enjoy it. He won't enjoy all that money that he made. He could become depressed. You know how many people are depressed? But he has all this money in the world. Where did all this depression come from? There's so many examples. There's so many kinds of diseases. And it's not hereditary. It could be from anywhere. He could have caught it on a trip. How? Why? It's from Shamani. So all of this, Sofar is telling Iyov, no philosophy here. Well, let's leave philosophy out. These are the facts. Have you considered all of this? You have to look at the bigger picture, but we can't. We only live so long. Just to like to finish with Sofar's last words, which are very powerful. Sofar adds the following detail. And by the way, when Hashem goes after the Rasha, many times what happens to the Rasha, to the wicked, will become public knowledge. He won't just die or lose his money and nobody will find out about it and not make anything of it. No, no, no. Sometimes what will happen is it will be the headlines. People will be surprised. And Hashem sometimes does this in a big way, in such a public way, so people should see realize and learn from this, that everything is Bashracha, that there is Din Bechishbon, Yesh Din Beyesh Dayan, that there is a judge. Hashem wants to teach lessons. He's not just going after someone, he's not just going to punish him. It's not just the attribute of justice that's gonna exact punishment from him. Many times it will happen in a very grandiose way, in a very public way. So clearly that people will say, wow look, to the best, to the greatest to the richest, look, this can happen. Don't be so overconfident. To reveal this is a very important idea in the sanctification of Hashem's name. There's a story of a couple that on Yom Kippur, the house fell down on them and they died. Yom Kippur is a fast day. Most Jews fast. When they removed the rubble from the house, they saw that the couple had eaten. There was still food in their mouth. Look, they were desecrating Hashem's name. That was a chilul Hashem. They, they were trying to keep it a secret that they don't keep Yom Kippur properly. 
Hashem says, I'm going to make it public knowledge. You can't hide from me. And people should know that. You cannot hide from Hashem. And that is exactly what the rabbis tells us in the Kavot, all your deeds, those that are public, those that are concealed, that nobody may know them, they're all written down. And Solomon, in the last verse of Kohelet, says it in more powerful terms. Whether it's concealed or not, whether it's good or not, everything in the end will be revealed. Hashem will make it public knowledge. So at some point, everything will become known. The rabbis tell us that the reason why the soul is ashamed of itself upstairs is not only because it is able to see in a video its entire life go by the mistakes that it made. It's because the relatives will also see it. So the soul has the greatest gehenom in the shame that it has to endure when it sees all of that. Unless it took steps while it was alive to rectify it. So Sofa makes a very strong argument. Two years of listen. He's there. He's aware of everything. And at some point, we'll all be able to realize it. At some point. Hopefully, hopefully, we should be able to see the good things that we did and not the negative things. And that's what Shalom Omela says. Some things people don't know about. There's some things that are good and some things that are not so good. But let us hope that we focus on doing only good and only the good will become public knowledge.